Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Social Contract, a Commander podcast. I'm Mike Almond, and joining me is my co-host, Alex Lapp. Alex, what's up, man? Not too much, Mike. We're happy to be here, and uh, we got some fun, different ways to play the game today. Yeah, we talk a lot about how to best enjoy uh, the game itself, how to have more fun with your standard play group, uh, playing online, just how to enjoy the game in kind of its own format a little bit more. And then at one point, when we were giving advice, you brought something up that's really cool in that, hey, try a couple of different variants. You know, try something like Two at a Giant if it's not something that you've played recently. There's a bunch of other types of games that you can play in the game. And we got some feedback from that. And there's a little bit of content out there, but I don't think that there's a whole lot as far as you should really try this stuff out it can really spice things up um and we're actually going to talk about that today yeah mike uh i want to clarify here that we're talking about variants of the game commander that can be played with the commander decks that are already legal the ones you already have uh we're not talking about uh tiny leaders or Oathbreaker or anything like that today we're talking about variants of the, of the core game as it's currently played yep we're we're talking about adjusting the sliders <laughs> on on the uh, the AI for the game a little bit, go. if that makes sense. Um, so I'm actually going to start us out with a really simple one. Um, one of my favorite mechanics in Magic, and especially in Commander, is Monarch. You know, just when this happens, you become the Monarch. And if somebody deals combat damage to you, they become the Monarch. All it is is just you drawing an extra card at the beginning of your end step. It's a really simple mechanic, and from the spoilers that we've seen slash released, uh, depending on when this episode comes out of the newest Commander set, there's a lot of cards that are leaning in this way, but there weren't for a long time. So we're just going to throw Monarch in there. We just call it First Blood Monarch. All this is is that there is essentially a crown that you can take at the beginning of the game by being the first one to deal combat damage to somebody. From that point, that player who did the combat damage becomes the Monarch. And then the Monarch is just a something that exists for the rest of the game. It's a really simple way to play, to add a little, little tiny twist, a little bit of lemon into the, mm -hmm. commander, uh, the commander recipe here. And I haven't had any regrets in introducing it into any of my playgroups. Is this something that you've ever done, Alex? Now, I haven't done this personally, Mike, but I, you're definitely not the first person who's told me about this idea of First Blood Monarch. From what I hear, a lot of uh, casual playgroups will house rule this and not even really consider it a, a variant of Commander, but really just they'll, they'll just play that way. Whoever draws First Blood will get Monarch. And one day we might have an episode about uh, some of the issues with the commander format but uh one of those issues is that uh aggro and attacking with creatures is a very important and core part of the game of magic and some colors lean on that more heavily than others sure uh, but commander has just by virtue of having more players and having higher life totals for those players it's much harder to win the game with combat at a given power level than it would be to win a, a standard game or a modern game through combat. Because uh, just quite simply, instead of having to burn through 20 life, you're having to burn through 40 life for each player or 120 in a normal game. Um, right. So First Blood Monarch just is a very subtle push. It doesn't suggest that everybody starts at a low life total to encourage aggro. It, it simply props aggro up a little bit by encouraging players to swing at each other which will speed the game up, but not a significant amount. I think it's a nice idea, and uh, and you might want to try it. Absolutely. Like you said, we'll get into it probably a little bit down the road. They're trying, I think, a little bit in making the aggro and burn spells a little bit more viable with the damage multiplier cards that they've come out with and things along those lines. But the way that it's actually set up, it's real hard to just be the aggro swing out go as fast as possible player with creatures yeah and have a chance to win without having some other tie-in like oh by the way these aggro creatures have infect or oh by the way there are some of these aggro creatures that say when it hits you 
player's life total is cut in half or is reduced to one. There's, there's weird stuff that you can do to try and go with that, but the standard, I play a hasty 1-1 one, one goblin on turn one, and I swing with it, well, when you're doing half as much and you have you know, double the amount of players, including yourself in the game, it's going to make it a little bit harder just by adding a, hey, we want to encourage swinging out. We also want to encourage, hey, there's a little card draw. There's a little cup. It makes the game go a little bit faster in a weird way. But at the very least, it, it's also fun to just be like, I know this might not be the best attack that I can make, but I also really just want to wear that cool crown. So I'm going to hit you and I am king slash queen of the table for well, literally probably just until the pass of the turn and somebody else hits me. So that's one where we're not really tweaking anything as far as the actual game. We're going to start moving to things that absolutely change the play style and some of the actual rules. Why don't you tell me a little bit about Two-Headed Giant? I know you love playing this format. I do love Two-Headed Giants. Now, Two-Headed Giant is an official... Uh, I, I would hesitate to call it a format. It's a variance. Because Two-Headed Giant can be played in basically any format and that includes commander so this is one of the oldest and most beloved magic formats two headed giant has been around for a very long time mm -hmm. and basically the gist of it is that players team up two versus two and they're working together to defeat the other team of two players and honestly most of this variant is is pretty intuitive but there are quite a few edge cases that uh that can come up in the game of Commander that wouldn't necessarily come up in other formats. So uh, I'm just going to run down some of these yeah. and talk a little bit about how Two-Headed Giant works a little bit differently in, in Commander. Mike, have you played Two-Headed Giants uh, very much? Uh, so I've played with you a few times. Yeah. And it's one of those things where it kind of depends on how many people are in the playgroup. If you have a standard four pretty consistently, then it's a game that you can play relative ease mm -hmm. um as soon as you get into odd numbers or even if you just have more than four players even if you're still in even numbers worth of setup man it can get complicated because those games even though you can possibly go at the same time with each other it still means there's a lot of extra stuff to coordinate so my play group that i, I traditionally you know play with is either online with a couple of friends individually or you know, less recently, uh, dealing with potentially five, six, seven players and trying to speed up the game with other formats that we'll talk about a little bit later. I don't play Two-Headed Giant as much as I'd like to, is what it comes down to. Right, just like you were saying, Two-Headed Giant really works best when you have a pot of four. If you have yeah. more than four or less than four, probably want to go with one of the other variants we're going to talk about today. This one's really for four people right on right. the nose. So let's, let's talk a little bit about Two-Headed Giant. So Two-Headed Giant uses the same ban list as whatever format you're playing it in, uh, with one exception, which for EDH actually doesn't matter, because this card is banned in Two-Headed Giant and EDH, and that mm. is Irayo Soratami Ascendant, which okay. uh, you may not have heard of because nobody plays it because it's banned, but sure. basically it's a legendary creature that uh, is a flip uh, creature from Kamigawa. You fulfill requirements, it flips. And when it flips, it has the static ability, uh, counter the first spell each player casts each turn, which oh. is, of course, incredibly oppressive in multiplayer environments. Of yeah, that's gross. Two-headed giant <laughs> is one. So I'm very glad that's not a thing. <laughs> even, even if it weren't banned in EDH, which it is, it's also banned in two-headed giant. Makes sense. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about this. Teammates are going to share their life total, and that life total is 50. Uh, with your teammate, you're going to win and lose the game together. If one of you wins, you both win. If one of you loses, you both lose. And you're going to share the steps and phases of a turn, right? So you're each going to take your untap step, your upkeep step, your draw step, all at the same time. And once you're ready to uh, pass priority, you're passing priority as a team to, to push phases. Uh, your boards and hands are going to remain separate from each other. So your battlefield is not your teammate's battlefield and your hand is not your teammate's hand. Uh, although you're absolutely allowed to look at each other's hands and, mm -hmm. and you probably should. You want to strategize and... You want to coordinate, yeah. Exactly. It's literally, it's literally two heads sharing a body. Exactly. Right? It's exactly. a two-headed giant. Got it. 
Uh, but you can't cast spells out of your teammate's hand, and you mm-hmm. can't use your, your teammate's mana to cast your spells. Um, that's why Battle Bond, which had a lot of those things that let you do that, like the assist mechanic and like donating mana, uh, those were designed specifically for Two-Headed Giant because they're things that, that you can't really do normally in that format. So when you attack uh, in, in your combat step, you attack together, of course, at the same time, and you can attack either opponent. You can't attack your teammate, and you're on the same team have to attack one of your opponents um and during the declare blocker step you'll also block together and you can cross block for your teammate so if one of your opponents is attacking your teammate you can say i'll declare one of my creatures as a blocker to block for my teammate um in in that way if that makes sense to you mike that's that's just kind of a way that your boards are separate except in this one instance during combat then you can kind of protect each other so clarify Um, a couple things for me alex yeah yeah what's up so, if I have something with, like, uh, a myriad, where mm-hmm. I make a copy for it for each opponent that I could attack, does that work in Two-Headed Giant? Because I have two different opponents that I can attack? It does. That's an excellent question, Mike, and that's actually okay. the next section of things I was going to talk about. Specifically sure. to your question, if an effect says each opponent, that's two. You have two opponents. Okay. All right. So, let's go through some of those those buzzwords that we see a lot on on cards in edh that may or may not have different meanings in two-headed giant so if you see the word you that's just still going to mean you it's not your teammate it's just you um if you have a card from battle bond maybe it says your team that does mean your team that's we're clear on that one if a card says an opponent it means either of your two opponents but not your teammate so, unfortunately, a lot of group hug cards that I like specify opponents so they can right. be shared with your teammate. I, I'm sure you know that pain, Mike. Yeah. Um, just like I had just said, each opponent means each opponent, of which you have two. Uh, each player means each player, and there's four of those. Uh, if something happens on each phase, it happens once on that phase. But if something says each player stepper phase, that's going to be twice. So okay. if something says at the beginning of each player's upkeep or each player's pre-combat main phase, that's going to trigger two times. But if it just says at the beginning of each upkeep, it only happens once on your shared team's upkeep and once on the opposing team's shared exactly. upkeep. Exactly. Got but it. If it says each player's upkeep, it'll trigger twice on that upkeep because okay. it's once for each player. That's so we, so we share of. life totals, but we have separate battlefields. Yes. Uh, but if one of the players loses, both of the players in that team lose. So is Infect still a thing that's 10 counters and players done at that point? That's an excellent question, Mike. You're asking all the right questions because that's the next section I have right here. Hey, uh, we're not sharing the same outline here, so that actually makes no, me feel I, pretty good. No, I have my own notes for this one, and, and you're just going right down the list. I'm intuitive. Um, if any player takes 21 commander damage, right? You know, Mm -hmm. the commander damage rule. The whole team loses the game. Okay. Uh, Likewise, if your team has a combined total of 15 or more poison counters between the two of you, you'll lose the game as a team. So So that does change a little bit. It does change. As far as, okay. If if you have five poison counters and I have 10 poison counters and we're on a team, when I get my 10th poison counter, we will both lose the game because we have 15 combined. But if you have 11... And I have none, and we're on the same team. We're still good. Yes, got yes. it. Okay, in, so that's pretty cool. That's, the normal that normal game stops of BDH one of the 10. problems. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you have a voting effect, which uh, has appeared in in some formats like Conspiracy, teammates will uh, vote individually, and and each player will get their own vote. Uh, here's here's an interesting one that uh, I actually didn't know prior to doing my research. Uh, before we started playing this game together but if both teammates would become the monarch at once that's something that that only could theoretically happen in a format like this where multiple players are attacking at once Um, if both teammates would deal combat damage to the opposing team member who themselves has monarch then the current monarch will choose which of their attackers becomes the monarch? Huh. Do you know that one, Mike? I, no, no, I, I <laughs> for sure. 
I was all excited about my, hey, we're going to spice up the game a little bit, just make Monarch, like, you know, get, take a dry erase marker, put it on a crown, draw a little crown, and you can right. pass it around the table. It'd be awesome. I, Man, now that's that's a headache that could potentially exist for me in the future. So let's say you and I are on a team. We're both attacking the Monarch. Sure. Uh, we both deal damage to him. That player will pick which of the two of us gets to be the Monarch, which is to say which one of the two of us gets to be the person who draws a card on our end step. And then the and, other player is not the monarch. They don't get to draw that card. Yeah, and, you know, if that player gets to say, okay, which one of these people is going to be easier to attack back into when it's my turn? That's actually pretty cool. I like that mechanic. Absolutely. Um, City's Blessing from Ixalan. It only checks your your board. If you have 10 permanents, sure. you'll ascend. Um, for triggers, people who... Uh, have played a lot of the game, might be familiar with the term ACNAP or active player, non-active player. Uh, that's kind of a, a system within Magic that describes how abilities, triggered abilities, go on the stack. Um, for this game, this is not APNAP, but at NATS, active team, non-active team. Got it. Um, basically the exact same way. All of the active team's triggers will go on the stack in any order they choose. And then the non-active team's triggers go on the stack in any order they choose. The non-active team's triggers resolve first. Of course, they enter the stack last. That's sure. uh, That might be a little bit beyond the scope of, of this, but just relevant to mention. And mm -hmm. last but not least, Mike, if the two teammates can't agree on something that requires them to agree, the player on the right has the final say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The player on the right has fiat. That is a real rule. That is... Man, that is an interesting. What kind of can you can you recall a scenario where that came into play, or is that just like mm. a the absolute like nuclear button kind of option there? What, like, what I find, what? Mike, is <laughs> is if I tell people about that rule, the player on the right is far more likely to invoke their fiat than if I don't <laughs> tell them about that rule, and then naturally they'll ask me about it at some point. If you. If you give me a button to press, I will press the button. Exactly. All right, fair enough. Seating arrangement okay. matters. All right, that's all I had for that. And I, but now the problem is you've told everybody about that button that maybe they've played two headed giant, but they didn't know that exists. So make so sure now if, there's, you're, if you're playing two headed giant, sit on the right. There's going to be such a weird game of musical chairs for every game now. <laughs> you're, you're. I want you to take a moment of silence for the amount of actual injuries that you've caused before the game starts. Uh, um, okay, so. Two headed giant. There's there's more to it than I thought, but I still had a pretty good idea of it. I I kind of like what you're talking about as the interactions as uh, you're individual players, but you're on the same team. You share a life total. You share these steps, etc. And there's a couple of things that do adjust and change when it's individual versus each player, etc. So it's pretty cool. Um, we're gonna move on to two different types of variants that bring something from outside of your standard set. Uh, these are different types of cards uh, with a theme that actually play to the game itself. Uh, I'm going to start with the Plane Chase. So, Alex, you've played Plane Chase before. Is it something that you have a decent amount of experience with, or is it like, a, oh, we played it once or twice? And Yeah, Mike, I've, I've only played Plane Chase once or twice. I have a very, awesome. a very simple understanding of it. I understand that you uh, travel between planes and you have a chaos yep. die. But other than that, I don't really play it very much. Sure. So as previously confirmed uh, by you in one of our uh, other episodes, uh, you're all planeswalkers. So this format allows you to literally planeswalk to different planes that have different benefits or hindrances or effects depending on what the plane is and what you're actually doing. Um, there's two different ways to play. There's a set of cards that are different planes. Think of them almost like world enchantments that we've talked about, except for you have the ability to change them pretty regularly. Uh, there's a six-sided die that has four blank sides, one plane chase side, which means whatever plane you're on, you go to another plane, and one that has a chaos symbol, which means you would do the chaos effect of whatever plane you're on. Now, on every player's turn, they get one free roll at sorcery speed to try and do whatever they want to. 
Maybe you want to get to a different plane. Maybe you want to get to the chaos effect because some of those can be absolutely nasty or absolutely awesome. And then if you want to roll the die again, it's a cumulative mana each time. So one generic mana to do it a second time. It's two generic mana to do it a third time. It's three generic, so on and so forth. Some of the planes, and when I'm looking at Magic Gatherer, it says there's 78 of these different planes. Some of them are extremely specific. Uh, like saying in the plane of Akum in Zendikar. Players may, may cast enchantment spells as though they had flash. Okay, cool. The chaos effect is whenever you roll chaos, destroy target creature that isn't enchanted. So maybe you're in an enchantment deck and you want to have flash. So you don't ever want to leave this plane. But you also have a one in six chance where if you do roll, well, there's a good chance that you can kill this, this player's commander because it's a problem. You also get into some of the really fun ones where it's basically... Anytime a player, uh, it fields a summer, uh, whenever a player casts a spell, that player may gain two life. Whenever you roll chaos, you may gain 10 life. Fun. Sure. Why not a problem? There's planes that give all creatures vigilance. And if you roll chaos, your creatures get indestructible. There's a goat plane in gold meadow. Whenever a land enters the battlefield, that land's controller creates three goat tokens. Whenever you roll chaos, create a goat token. There's ones that double mana. There's ones that allow you to play extra cards. There's ones that are telling you that permanents untap during every other player's untap step. There's ways that you can do this to where I haven't played this way, but everybody can have their own planar deck. And they can basically roll to whatever plane everybody is sharing at the time. They can replace it with their own plane, and then everybody's playing on that. What I like doing a lot more is having a completely randomized deck and it's accessible to everybody. So you don't know what's going to come up. It may help you. It may not help you. It may benefit one of your opponents if you get off the plane that you think you want to leave and it's something far, far worse. There are way too many of these planes to talk about individually. But I, I guarantee you, if you go and look them up, they are a wacky way to basically say there's a world enchantment all the time. I hope you like it. And if you don't, there's still a way for you to get out of it. Alex, tell me what you think about plane chase. Yeah, my good. It's definitely a very, very chaotic format. Oh yeah. Um, it's really anything can happen. And I think that that really attests to the charm of some of these variants we're talking about that, uh, even players, and and perhaps especially players with uh, less skill and, and less attuned decks can thrive. Because when you in, increase the amount of randomness and increase the amount of luck, um, the chaos that anything can happen, mm -hmm. that allows these more swingy effects where you can make some goats, you can untap your permanence, and even the underdog can come out on top. And I think that, that that's something that's quite special. Yeah, absolutely. You, you, you likened it to something that I have a pretty good metaphor for. Um, so we talked about it a little bit with Group Hug in that when you give everybody more resources than they thought they were going to have or expected to have, the amount of separation from one powerful deck to another less powerful deck starts to decrease. The more variance, the more extras, the more disparity and chaos that you add, you're absolutely right everything becomes a little bit more balanced over time. Oh, oh, you know, might might put somebody into a position where, oh, this plane that we just went to is way better for my deck than every other one. And I was already in the lead, which can happen. But it's a really cool way to kind of throw a wrench into the game. But that wrench also tends to make things go extremely fast. Um, you're going to talk about I think a little more common of a, at least a name. I don't know if people play it as often as they probably should, because I know I haven't played it except for a couple of times with you. And I had a great time. Tell me about Arch Enemy. Yeah, Mike, Arch Enemy is a fantastic variant. And this is another one, uh, just like Plane Chase and just like Two-Headed Giant, that kind of sits on top of another format. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and in, in this case, we're going to be talking about Arch Enemy EDH. What a what a fun and unique format. This is a three v one asymmetric multiplayer format. Okay, where you have the Gate Watch, which are uh, the team of three. You liken yourselves to Planeswalkers, and you're fighting against the Arch Enemy, who you might in, in imagine as Nicol Bolas, perhaps, and uh, they will have powerful effects that allow them to hold their own against a team of three people fighting against them. And those effects are quite interesting. But let's let's briefly talk about how we set this game up. Sure. So at the start of the game, you're going to get your scheme deck. The scheme deck are these oversized cards, a lot like the planes in, in Plane Chase that Mike just talked about. And that scheme deck is going to get shuffled. It's going to get cut just like a normal deck. And then it's going to go to the arch enemy's command zone which is the same place that uh, the Plane Chase cards reside in. Um, just like Plane Chase, everything that's on the card is going to act like eminence. So even though it's not on the battlefield, its effects are still going to trigger, its ongoing effects are still going to, to happen. Um, so the Arch Enemy is going to begin the game with 40 life, and they will always go first. They always draw for turn when they go first. And as a turn-based action on their pre-combat main phase, that's the first main phase that they have each turn, uh, they're going to set a scheme into motion. Uh, setting a scheme into motion means that they will take the top card of the scheme deck and they will flip it and resolve it. And let's let's talk about some of these schemes really quick. I'm not going to talk about very many because there's 70 of them, but uh, these these are really fun. And a quick a quick aside on that, Alex. Yeah. I, when we talk about plane chase and arch enemy being really fun or being a really good way to mix things up, again, we're talking 70 plus cards and options in both of them. First of all, it doesn't mean that you have to have every single card to be able to play the format, but check them out if you want to, or just pick up a pack of them because this is a fun way to, I'm going to change things up constantly without repeating things too often. It's also why we're not going to talk about all this. We have a hard time getting through 20 cards in an episode without taking too long. If we have an additional 140-something, it's going to be a day-long podcast. And I don't want to do that. I don't think you want to do that either. <laughs> Go Absolutely. on ahead. So uh, let's let's just talk about a couple of these scheme cards. Uh, so here we have one called Behold My Grandeur. All the schemes are are very interestingly named. They're not named like any other cards in Magic. But Behold My Grandeur is a scheme that says, when you set this scheme in motion, add blue, black, red. When you set this scheme in motion, if you control six or more lands, you may search your library for a card with converted mana cost six or greater, reveal it, put it into your hand, and then shuffle your library. So that's a random effect that the arch enemy could get at the beginning of their pre-combat main phase, and uh, typically that would be followed by uh, a bunch of nail biting and some groans from the from the Gatewatch team. Let's let's look at one more other one of these schemes here. How about feed the machine? Feed the machine is a scheme that says when you set this scheme in motion, target opponent chooses self or others. If that player chooses self, that player sacrifices two creatures. If that player chooses others, each of your other opponents sacrifices a creature. So it's not just very straightforward stuff. We also have some political options. You're forcing your opponents to turn against each other and, and make hard choices. I think that there's some really interesting things in there. So uh, let's go back to, to how this format works. If you're curious about reading more schemes, you can, of course, look those up. And I recommend it. They're, they're very interesting. So... Let's talk about the Gatewatch team now. The Gatewatch, each of them begins the game with 20 life, and they don't share a life total. So this is different from Two-Headed Giant in that way, in that if one or two of the Gatewatch members of your teammates lose the game, uh, the team has not yet lost the game. You can succeed as a Gatewatch team, even if there's only one of you left. You can all still win. Um... So likewise, if one of your teammates wins the game, you all win the game. But if one of you loses the game, you don't all lose the game. So you have a little bit of a leg up there. Just like Two-Headed Giant, you're going to share the steps and phases of a turn. 
Your boards and your hands remain separate. You're going to attack the arch enemy together, and you can cross block for your teammates. Um, so a lot of this is quite similar to Two-Headed Giant. I'm going to touch on a few interesting points that I didn't mention for Two-Headed Giant, but that are still relevant here. Go if, right you, ahead. if you have an effect that prevents you from taking damage, your teammates can still take damage. Um, if you have an effect that prevents your life total from changing, uh, for, for this version, your teammates' life total can still change because you have separate life totals. That's right. different for Two-Headed Giant. Um, if you have an attack tax effect like Propaganda or Ghostly Prison or something like that, uh, your opponent can still attack your teammates and you can still block for your teammates. If uh, your team member, any of your team members, skip a phase or skip a turn or get an extra phase or get an extra turn, uh, your entire team will either skip or take that extra uh, phase. So there was a there's a new creature that just got printed uh, or just got spoiled for, for Commander Legends that allows mm-hmm. extra steps and phases to be in your turn. If you were to play that in Arch Enemy, your entire team would get all of those additional steps and phases. And huh. last but not least, my very favorite, uh, if an effect would have your opponent gain control of one of your team members or you, uh, they will control your entire team. Whoa. So that's Mind Slaver, Soren. Alex, uh, that's problematic. <laughs> yeah, that's that's some fun stuff. When when I'm the arch enemy, I like playing my Emrakul deck and Mind Slaving uh-huh. the entire enemy team. Boy, howdy, is that fun. So Mike, have you played uh, very much arch enemy? You, you said you haven't played too much, but... I've, this, I've played... It's I've great, played once. Right? Yeah, it's... So I've played once, and the main issue was that it wasn't it wasn't that we didn't have a great time playing it. It was that we played it for one session, and then everybody wanted to be the arch enemy after we played one session. <laughs> and then the person who had the arch enemy cards moved. So we we basically got this taste, and then it, it, things fall through. No, um, Mike, I, I have a, a simple solution for you and for anyone yeah. listening. Uh, If you like the idea of playing Plane Chase or Arch Enemy, but you don't like the idea of buying a Plane Chase and Arch Enemy deck and perhaps buying oversized sleeves and oversized deck boxes to keep those cards in, there are apps for iOS and Android that will generate Plane Chase and Arch Enemy decks and function exactly as having that deck would. And you can just iterate through your schemes, iterate through your planes, and it works just fine. That's how we play it. And Mike, if if you ever wanted to play with your pod, but your your friend moved away, that would be a viable option for you. Yep. And I I discovered these things too far after the fact, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> but I know now, and that's what's important. Right. Knowing is half the battle. So I was gonna ask you, um, and then I think you kind of revealed your secrets here. If you prefer to be on the the Gatewatch side or the Arch Enemy side. And then you got real excited talking about if I'm the Arch Enemy, I play Emrakul every once in a while because it's fun to dance puppets dance with an entire team. Do you have a preference or am I, am I kind of pushing you into one at that point? Well, Mike, I can't deny how much fun it is to be the Arch Enemy and to monster the enemy team. However... Uh, what I really like is also playing on the Gatewatch team and using powerful symmetric group hug effects to boost my go. team up. So if it were up to me, I would be perfectly fine with either the Gatewatch or the Arch Enemy. And usually, because somebody else really wants to be the Arch Enemy, they want to wield those powerful scheme cards, mm-hmm. uh, I'll usually end up on the Gatewatch team. That's fair. I, I Just another reason why group hug is better the more stuff that you do guys absolutely so so those are the ones that are changing up a little bit of the actual style of the game based off of outside influence with the plane chase cards or the arch enemy scheme cards uh plan or die things like that what we're going to talk about next are things that change the role of the game because of either literally what role you are or who your allies are and whether or not you know Uh, We're going to start with a pretty simple one here uh, called Five Star. 
there's a couple of different names for it, but five star is the most standard one. If you're playing in a pod where you have more than four people, I recommend this because it is a way to play a little bit faster than you normally would in just a standard game of five or more. And it doesn't change a whole lot. All five star means is that the players that are directly adjacent to you when you're sitting down at the table, so on your left and your right, they're your allies. Everyone else is your enemy. Whoever's enemies are gone first and lose the game or out of the game, they're the winner. That's literally all it is. So if you're in a group of five, I have my friend on my left, I have my friend on my right, and the two players across the table from me are eliminated before anybody else can eliminate all of their enemies, I win. Now that sounds really simple, but that also means that every once in a while, you kind of have to throw your own allies under the bus because they have a slightly different objective than you. One of them has the same ally that you do, or the same uh, enemy that you do, but they also have a different enemy. So that means that every once in a while, you have to counterspell one of your friends to keep them from winning the game so you can win the game. Hey, I know you just played your commander and you're about to swing in, but you're going to hurt my friend on my right, Mr. Left Person. So I have to path to exile your commander <laughs> so you don't win right now. But I also have to make sure that I'm not doing too much damage to you because I need you alive for me to win so I can beat <laughs> the other two people across the table from me. So when you want to talk about a game and enjoy the politics of what you're doing, holy cow, does it change when you have similar goals, extremely similar goals, and just different names on who needs to be the winners for you to have a good time. It is the simplest game with the weirdest implications on what you're going to do moment by moment as things start getting a little bit tighter. And the second that one player dies, all hell breaks loose from that point. There is at least a little bit of chaos for every ensuing turn until another player dies. It's one of my most favorite ways to play without having to do a whole lot of extra work. Alex, have you played this at all? And if not, is it something that you would consider trying? Yeah, Mike, I had only heard about this before, but uh, I think that's quite poignant what you brought up, that even a very, very simple change to the rules of the game, simply saying uh, your partner is whoever is adjacent to you and anyone who isn't is your enemy, uh, that the politics iterating from that, it's it's like ripples in, in a pond. Oh, There's for so sure. many consequences of that. And and I think you explained them all very well. So I would just say that uh, I would like to play this very end. I think it sounds very interesting. And the other thing, just to keep piling on on, on why I like this format. Um, so when you get into a bigger pod... The other issue that you have traditionally is unless you have somebody playing that's an infinite combo deck or something along those lines, the game doesn't get 20% longer because you're adding another player. It gets exponentially longer more times than not. When you cut down the amount of win condition and you make it easier for people to play, you can add more players and still cut down on the amount of time without making somebody feel bad because, oh, well... If we've got this many people, I'm going to play my turn three, I win deck kind of thing. So if you ever want to shorten up the game, but still include everybody as much as possible, try it out. Uh, that's the real simple version. Now we're going to get into the more complicated, but I would argue still potentially more fun versions. Um, where you're not just changing who your allies are, but you're changing what your goal is based on your own individual role. Alex, tell me about what is potential potentially my favorite uh variant that we're going to talk about with kingdoms like i love kingdoms kingdoms is a variant for five or more players and each player has a secret objective they need to complete their objective to actually properly win the game so let's talk 
let's talk about logistics real quick. How do you give people a secret objective in a commander game when presumably the person giving out the objectives is also going to be playing the game? Uh, we have a very, very simple solution for that. We're going to walk over to the basic lands pile that your store, of course, keeps on hand for drafting. You're going to get one of each basic land. You're going to Plains, Forest, Mountain, Swamp, and Island. You're going to shuffle those out and give each player one face down. So everybody has one of the five basic lands. What does that mean? Let's go top to bottom. If you got planes, you're the king. Everybody knows who the king is. Once everybody has gotten their secret roll card, the king shows everybody their roll card. They're going to show everyone that they're the king. Uh, they're going to go first in the game, and their life total is 50 at the beginning. Okay. Their goal is to be the last player standing. Uh, All right, so king just wants to win. Yes, exactly. Cool. Um, however, if both they and one other player, specifically, win the game uh, if they're the last two players standing, and that other player is the knights. If you have the forest land you are the knight, and your goal is to protect the king. If you and the king are the last two people standing, you will both win the game. Now, we're going to loop back to this one, because all I'll say right now is the knight is loyal to the throne, not to the king. So next we have a mountain. If you draw the mountain, you're the bandit. Okay. Your goal is for the king to lose the game before you do. Okay. And then for you to to be the last one left alive. As long as you win the game and the king is already dead, you'll win. You're a bandit. That's all you care about. Okay. All right. Next, we have the swamp. If you're the swamp, you're the assassin. Your goal is also to be the last player standing. However... You need to make sure that the bandits are dead before the king dies. Because right. if the king dies and the bandits are still alive, the bandits will win and the, the assassin win. will lose. Okay. All right. Lastly, we have the island. If you get the island, you are the traitor or the usurper. You will like a usurper. Mm -hmm. Your goal is to directly cause the king, and only the king, to lose the game. If the king would lose the game because of you, that's through combat, uh, if you mail them out, if you play an effect that says target player loses the game, all, any and all of those work. If that would happen, the king doesn't lose the game, you become the king. Oh. You're going to change roles with the king, the king will become the usurper. You'll become the king. Your life total will become 50, and the king's life total, who is now the usurper, becomes one. So they're, oh, damn. <laughs> they're almost dead. They're basically <laughs> yeah, almost yeah. out of the game. Okay. Uh, when this usurpation, when this traitorous act takes place, play continues as normal. The old king is the new usurper. You're the new king. And the knight, as I alluded to earlier, protects you, the usurper, to the throne, because the knight is loyal to the throne. And the knight will win the game if the player who usurped the throne, the traitor, and the knight are still the last player standing. So the knight loves the king, but if the king's not looking to win, then maybe the knight's allegiance would uh, would waver. Um, so this there's a lot of different ideas coming at you here. But suffice to say that everybody has their own objectives in this game. Sure. But nobody knows who anyone else is except for the king. Not for certain, at least. Right, not for certain. You can definitely take your guesses. And that adds a whole new layer of politics onto the game, just like Mike described with Five Star. But this is, I would say, even more complex than the politics that arise out of Five Star. Because mm -hmm. now you have, you're wondering who's your friend, who's your enemy... Uh, am I able to make a move right now or will I screw myself over? Right. There are a lot of intricate political details that come into play. And the other good thing about this format, Mike, is that 
you can play this with, I would say, any number of players, five or greater. If you're going to play with uh, six people, which is fine, uh, you can add a second bandit, mm -hmm. and both bandits will win the game if the king dies. Uh, for if you have seven people, you can go ahead and add a second assassin, but only one assassin can be the last one standing. Only one assassin right. can win the game. Uh, that makes and sense. And then finally, if you are off your rocker enough to try a game of eights, you will add a second usurper, and only the usurper who kills the king will become the new king. Um, now, yeah, normally I would not advise <laughs> playing with a large number of players like this. However, sure. when you're playing a variant like this, there are more ways for the game to end rapidly than in a normal game. That so makes sense. You you have a little bit more leeway there. I would say in, even in a normal game, even I myself, I'm very reticent to play with five people, but a lot of these elements that we're talking about can really speed the game up and, sure. and allow you to play with more than four people. I will say this. First of all, if you're playing with a, if you're playing in a pot of eight, stop it. Go go Just play two two out of giant games or something. Like stop. That's what are you doing? That's that's aggressive uh, towards your psyche, and don't do that. Um, so a quick rundown just to make sure I've got it. King wins if the king and or the king and the knight are alive at the end of the game, and they're the last ones. Knight yes. wins if the king wins. The bandit wins if the bandit kills the king. And just if still, the king is dead. Just the dead. It's just dead. Yeah. If assassin, the king is dead, yeah. Assassin wins if the king is dead, but the bandits are dead before the king. And the usurper wins if they take over the king and then win as the king. Basically, yeah. Okay. Uh, just to just to clarify the difference between the bandit and the assassin, mm -hmm. uh, the bandits will win if the king dies, and the assassins will win if everyone else is dead before them. But that has the additional caveat that, of course, the bandits have to die first because if they don't, then they'll just win when the Makes king sense. dies. Yeah. So I I love this format uh, because it it sounds we've talked about it for a few minutes here. It sounds complicated. And then you play for about three minutes, and it's, oh, okay, I totally understand. Uh, my first time playing, I still didn't understand, and I know that I know for a fact that I was the knight. And it turned out to be a galaxy brain play on accident, where I attacked the king because they had the most life with my 2-2 creature, because it was something that when it dealt combat damage to a player, I got to do stuff. And everybody immediately assumed that I was aggressive towards the king and I was one of those roles where I wanted the king to die. So then from that point forward, they assumed that and I also got to protect the king in these subtle ways that was, oh no, he must be the, the assassin because he's trying to stop me from doing these other things while whittling down the king. Oh, well maybe he's the usurper because he wants to be the king but he wants us to be around so he can still win. What is he doing? And it's like, oh no, I'm, I'm just a fool. <laughs> and I made a mistake. <laughs> But it worked, and that's the kind of stuff that I like about uh, kingdoms. Um, Alex, do you have a favorite role in kingdoms? You know, it's good to be the king, Mike, um, <laughs> because you're you're really the center of attention, which is always nice. But it's also fun to be the knight and protect the king, while yep. also trying not to let on that you're trying to protect the king. Right. I I will say that I think the knight is my favorite role to be. But there is no better feeling than winning as the usurper, I think. I, it's just, it's one of those. Oh, yeah. If you win it, as the usurper, it's it just high feels fives all good. around. Yeah. <laughs> and, Except, and, more, yeah, yeah. and more importantly, if you can win as the usurper and the knight is still around. So you get to basically look at them and said, you were protecting this one, but now you protect me. And they go, okay. Yep. <laughs> And they go, yes, sir, Mr. King. Or like you said, if, some, if 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 the knight has a good feeling that the usurper is the usurper, or, or, you know, they have a good idea of who the usurper is, and you know what? I'm not a big fan of this monarchy, uh, <laughs> of a this patriarchy. most foul was for uh, Exactly. And you know what? I think that's going to be my new goal. I am going to be, I'm going to be the wandering knight, and we will see. Uh, if I can make some shenanigans happen. Uh, yes, thank you for explaining Kingdoms, Alex. I 
I love that. I love that variant a lot. One of the ones that uh, Mitch from Commander's Quarters actually came out with a video recently, and I'm really glad he did, because this is one that I don't think you're familiar with, or at least I've never played with uh, you, Alex. How? Tell me, what do you know about Secret Partners? Mike, I really don't know anything about Secret Partners. Um, awesome. Yeah, so go ahead and tell me. Okay, so it's similar to what you're talking about with Kingdoms in that you're going to have players with different roles. This is another one that's more based off of a five-player game. You can do a little bit more, um, but five-player is the most common. So with it, you're going to get a couple of basics. Get a mountain and a forest, for example. And then you're going to get two cards, one of each that actually match that color. So get a lightning bolt for the mountain and a giant growth for the forest. Okay? Then you're going to have one card that is just an artifact. It's a non-colored card. When you deal these cards out randomly, and you deal them secretly, before the game starts, the players with the basics reveal those cards. Now, whoever has the matching color to that basic knows in their head, that player is on my team. And whoever has the card that doesn't match anything they know they're essentially a lone wolf. And then you just play. So all this is, is that you basically want to make sure that your team wins and you have some amount of information in that, well, I need to make sure that my mountain brother, as the lightning bolt <laughs> player, I need to make sure that he survives. So everybody else is my enemy. But... The player who has the mountain, the player who has the forest, they don't know who their friends are. So they're defending themselves and attacking everybody. So it's literally secret partners because everybody knows that the mountain player and the forest player are absolutely against each other. And they have no idea who else is on their team, but they know at least one person is. The fun variant that you play with this and the way that I, a lot of people, when they do play, they reveal their card when they die. I think it is a lot more fun not to do so. Because you don't know if somebody just killed your teammate, or if somebody just killed the lone wolf, or if somebody killed the person that was on the other team versus you. And then you're still playing to that. So if I am you know, on the same team as somebody who has a basic, and I play a spell that could be abrasive to the same the person on the same team they might counter it and in my head i know for a fact this was going to hurt everybody else so much worse than you dang it but they don't know that so the amount of things that you have to do to actually try and help out your team without telling your team that you're there it's another fun political version of this game. Um, and again, it's if you have more players, if, if you're running in a pot of six, all you do is you just match up instead of having a lone wolf, you just put another basic in there with a card to match it. It is a fun, okay, this player died. Does that mean that we win? And you don't know until the game is over. And I like that. Alex, what do you what do you think? This sounds interesting, Mike. There's, a, I guess, a couple of things I'm not necessarily clear on. Like, sure, what what is the consequence of, uh, for example, the hidden team member somehow <laughs> thoroughly convincing uh, their teammate and and thereby everyone else at the table that they are in fact their teammate uh other than the fact that they can't reveal their card and, and make it certainly known it seems like there isn't really a gambit there right like oh yeah so, so i'm not really clear on, on, on that aspect so if you've played games like coup or more recently the booming among us things like that it almost turns into a bit of a bluffing game. 
because if you're the player by themselves, you don't want people to know that you're by yourself. So you're going to do things to interact with the with a team or with a player or even both to try and put yourself in a position where I need people to eliminate each other and win. Because it only comes down to what's the last remaining team. So if there's three players, there's no winner. Sometimes if there's two players, there's a winner, but sometimes not. So it turns into a game where you want to, you don't necessarily want to convince everybody that, hey, Mountain, I have the lightning bolt. You and I are on the same team. Because while now the Mountain knows, and okay, fine, you're on the same team, everybody else also has that information, which means they can target you two specifically. If you are lying and somebody else knows, well, he's not the player on the same team as the Mountain, because I am, because I have the lightning bolt. Well, now I know that information. So now, how do I play that against them? And it turns into this weird political game where you have to basically decide how subtle are you going to be about helping until it's the right moment to strike. So it's a, it's a tense game without having to... I'd like to think of it as Kingdom's Light because you have a much simpler goal and you have an easier win condition as far as I'm concerned. But the amount of thought that you have to put into how you're going to interact to still try and keep yourself hidden until it's the right moment, I, I love it. It definitely sounds intriguing. Um, I'll, I'll have to try that out sometime. We'll, we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll get a uh, we'll get a game on a cockatrice or something like that and see how you feel about it. I, I, I guarantee, maybe I'm doing a bad job of explaining it because it's one of those things that you have to be in that position of, okay, this could be bad because I want to counter this spell, but I also don't want them to know I'm countering this spell to help out my teammate yet. Maybe I let... And it's just a little bit, it's a little twist every single time. And there's a lot of tension until it finally snaps and then the game pops. But I love it. So, Alex, we've got a couple of games that you can play in your standard group with the First Blood Monarch, with Two-Headed Giant. Uh, games where you can download an app on your phone uh, and just change up your standards. Or if you're playing with more players, we've got Five Star, we've got Kingdoms, we've got Secret Partners. That's not necessarily all of the game variants by any means. There's a bunch of others, but I think those are the most common ones. Uh, what do you think is your most favorite to play? I'm going to be honest. I think Two-Headed Giant is, is yeah. my favorite. Yeah, it's, Just, it's, uh, yeah. It's, a good, it's, a good, it's a good change on an already going thing. And you're a group hug player. So am I. Like, I, I, you like the idea of this person is on my team. We're going to work together. We have a common goal. This is awesome. I, I could absolutely see that being your favorite. Definitely. Uh, I, I got to say for myself, I love kingdoms. <laughs> when, kingdoms we were breaking, when we were breaking down the, the actual, okay, who's going to talk about what? I wanted to talk about kingdoms, but you're also the one who introduced me to it. So <laughs> it's all right. I'll see. I'll see this one to you, buddy. But man, it oh, be the usurper, be the wandering knight one day. Those are some games uh, variants to play with your play group. Try them out. Give us some feedback on what you like, what you don't like. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. Come back with some advice for veteran players and newer players talk about a couple of cards that should be seen a little bit more often. And then Alex is going to take us into the judge's corner and talk to us a little bit about hexproof versus shroud versus protection versus protection from uh, everything along those lines. And we're going to get a little bit more insight on how you can interact with some cards that maybe you didn't think you could. We'll be right back. All right, Alex, something old, something new. My advice for newer players or just players that are trying stuff out, rank, uh, frankly, is take your commander out of your deck and just run the deck as it is. Just run it as a 99 
card deck that you would play in Commander. I'm not asking you to tell me that it's more power without, without it or anything like that, but see if it still functions. Because it's okay if your deck revolves around the Commander. That's why we play this format. It's so, it's the higher life totals, the ability to do more big play magic, everything along those lines all feed into it. But it's so you can have your deck have a theme. And more times than not, it revolves around your commander. I totally get it. But spot removal is a thing. And if you have absolutely no fun playing your deck because you can't play your commander or your commander can't be on the battlefield long enough for you to actually do anything else, it's a real big problem running your head into a wall. Try and play out your deck as if you didn't have a commander. And just see how it goes. See if you're still able to play. See if you're still on curve on things. See if it doesn't completely disrupt your entire play style. And if it does, maybe think about putting some other things in there. Maybe thinking about, oh, I have this Voltron commander. Well, all right. Voltron's cool. I love Voltron. I've got three different Voltron decks at this point. If my commander is out, if it's too expensive for me to cast, if I can't do things to keep it on the board, well, then what? Do I have other creatures that would give me maybe not the same ability to win the game or to have the same kind of effect on the game, but do I still get to participate the way that I'd want to? Because you can do a lot of things to protect a Voltron commander, but there's still ways to get around it. You can do a lot of things to go with a Marin deck for a lot of graveyard recursion, does your deck still do stuff if Marin is way too expensive to cast? Try and see if your deck still plays at least close to what you'd like it to without your commander. And if it does, you're going to have a lot more fun because you're still going to do everything you want to do, even if things aren't going your way. What do you think, Alex? Yeah, that's good advice that uh, I probably should take, but I'm not going to because uh, I, I tend to, to crush on my commanders pretty hard. Well, I would hope you would take that advice. It's the advice you gave to me when you played my Ruhan deck. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, you got to have something in here in case Ruhan is removed too many times. And I Well, said, you understand that it's not like yeah. my decks stop working if I lose no. the commander. They just no. get way weaker. No, and, and don't get me wrong. I'm not saying sit down with your play group and let them play Commander and you play 99. That's not that's not what I'm saying. Try it out. Play a little Goldfish. See if you can still do stuff. I don't think you're going to regret it. If nothing else, you'll realize, oh, well, maybe I need a couple more of these effects in here. Or maybe I need something to synergize in case my, cam my Commander isn't there. Because when we play by ourselves, we're playing Goldfish, we're playing Magic Solitaire. It's always Magic Christmas Land, because you don't necessarily play and say, all right, well, somebody's going to remove this on turn three, so I'm going to move this out. Try it, and just see how it looks. What do you got for us this week, Alex? I'm like, I agree with you on that on that subject. It is good advice. Yeah, um, one of one of the <laughs> <laughs> One of the biggest pitfalls I find is, is uh, especially, this can happen with newer players, because you can have a a very good stuff style commander. Maybe your commander has uh, a card advantage effect on it. Maybe it has a ramp effect on it. Sure. And because of that, maybe you're pretty lean on putting card draw and ramp into your deck that maybe you should have more of because you feel that you can rely on your commander. I'm going to tell you right now, you cannot rely on your commander for card draw and ramp because when it gets removed... You're not going to have the card draw and ramp to be able to afford to, right. to get back on your feet. You, All right. So, yeah. You, yeah. You can consider it a commander and ramp card if it's something that does ramp. You can consider it a commander and a card draw card. But don't say, I don't need these things because they exist. I have a Karametra deck that I just got done with. There's still some ramp in that deck, even though Karametra ramps I hope whenever so. I do stuff, because that's what it does synergize with the effect don't rely on the card to create the effect otherwise i think that's the simpler and more concise way that i should have put everything for the last five minutes but we'll work on that 
Go ahead, Alex. <laughs> yeah, so what I have this week for veteran players is uh, build your deck first and your win cons last. Now, that may sound weird to, to some of you more Johnny, more spiky players. Mm-hmm. That like, why, why am I even building a deck if not to win? But if there's anything that we can teach you from this podcast, The Social Contract, it's that... In my opinion, fun is more important than anything else when it comes to this game. Absolutely. And winning is fun. Don't get me wrong. It's fun mm-hmm. to win. But the act of winning is perhaps, in my opinion, the least fun part of the game. So when I say build your deck first and your win cons last, I mean when you're coming up with your deck... You know, let your mind run free, build whatever kind of deck you want to build. And don't even worry about how that deck is going to win. Because I'll tell you right now, you probably just heard our recent episode. We talked about alternate win cons. It is so easy to chuck a couple of those into your deck and voila, you have a win con Mm -hmm. if and when you need it. Um, Or if one of your archetypes in any way revolves around... Uh, making creatures combat is always in your back pocket uh, if your deck revolves around draw or mill then draw or mill is always in your back pocket win cons are not they don't have to be the core part of your deck they can just be a part of your deck right and if that is a little bit too much for you to hear uh instead maybe try putting some wackier less efficient <laughs> win cons in your sure. deck and uh, and we'll have something very apropos for that in a minute here. Yeah, I mean it's so think of it think of it this way. Decide what you want your deck to do, not how it wins, just what you want to do. Because if you're building a deck because oh I I want to win on turn two. All right, uh, maybe this conversation isn't for you. But if it's I like I like what you're saying here. Build your deck based off what you want to accomplish with it what you want to build what you want to do i want to make a tokens deck and i want to get as many tokens as possible i want to build a card draw deck and i want to just draw a ton of cards i want to build a rent do those things and build that deck and then worry about how it wins after you've built it Uh, i think you talked about it a couple episodes ago where you usually put your lands in last because they're your vegetables you're your vitamins i've actually started going the other way where I start with, I have 36 lands, and I'll adjust those 36 lands based off of the colors of the cards and how many pips I've got and stuff like that as I'm actually building the deck. But I'm I'm already doing this, and it's it, it makes me really happy that this is your advice for veteran players because it means I'm, I can pretend to be a veteran player this week. <laughs> um, because I want to build my lands, and that's my land base. And then I'll put in the card that say, this is what the deck does. This is how it plays. And then I'll find win cons based off of what those cards are, as opposed to the opposite. I'm finding the conclusion based off of the evidence, rather than finding the evidence based off the conclusion. Does that make sense? Yeah, um... Yeah, that, that makes, that makes sense. <laughs> you, sound, you sound absolutely convinced, so I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the fact of the matter is that, Mike, that uh, really even in your most flights of fancy, that the wackiest, most ridiculous, janky deck you can build, I guarantee you there are win cons that fit into that deck. Yeah. Don't worry about those till later. Just have your fun. Then put the win cons in after that. Feldegriff wins games. And Feldegriff makes people hippos. It's okay, guys. <laughs> like, relax. Hip- You'll, hippos we'll all get okay. that. The hippos will be okay. Okay. Okay, Alex. So that's our advice for players this week. Uh, you've already kind of alluded to it, so I'm going to let you start with oh, our fuck next fuck segment fuck. here. Because it's the variance episode, so we're going to vary things up. Um, Alex... It, tell me about a card that we don't see enough of in our... Ooh, can I see that? Absolutely, Mike. So we were talking about uh, weaker, wackier, 
less efficient win cons. Mm-hmm. Here's the payoff for that. If you have an artifact deck, many people do. True. That artifact deck probably has a lot of artifacts in it. Maybe uh, 20, maybe, yeah. maybe 30. I'll give me a second here. Maybe yes, your math checks out. Your yes. math checks out. They, they Artifact decks do, in fact, have artifacts. Yes, presumably your deck will have a very high number of artifacts. Sure. Because it's going to make your deck work. And also, all of your ramp will be artifacts. So take whichever 20 or 30 core number you do for your uh, for your base strategy and then add in the additional 10 plus for ramp and you're pushing almost half of your deck as artifacts. So in with respect to that, let's talk about this card. Mirror Incubator. This is an artifact for six mana and it has the activated ability, pay six, tap and sacrifice it, search your library for any number of artifact cards, exile them, then create that many 1-1 one, one colorless mirror artifact creature tokens, then shuffle your library. Um, Mike, if there is such a magic card that was the incarnation of the phrase, I'm pulling out all the stops, <laughs> Or we're swinging away, or what have you? The the moonshot. Sure. This this is surely that card. It's it, twelve it's, mana. It is a hail mary, but and you exile most of your one. library. But if it works, you're doing great. And if somebody wets the board, then you lose the game. There is that. There is that. <laughs> um. So here's the thing. I love this card, and most of the time when we're talking about cards that you should include or you should at least take a look at because maybe it's not absolutely a staple in these decks because if it was we wouldn't be talking about them as much everybody but know about them but here are some commanders that really like it when you have a ton of artifacts or a ton of creatures or a ton of artifact creatures or a ton of creatures coming out onto the battlefield at the same time um do you have one really cool token because Brutaclad would love for you to make 35 of it at near instant speed. Mm -hmm. um, you know who really likes lots of creatures coming in, into existence at the same time? Perforos. Big fan. Loves doing that. Um, if, you're, if you're really wanting to go into it, um, we've talked all win cons. Man, I would love to see this go with a mechanized production. Yeah, there that, you go. Because that's not even something that people are necessarily going to... Oh, okay. Oh, oh no. It's, oh, it's a no. surprise kind of card because you're not playing that necessarily on this. I, I'm going to make it on my soul ring. Oh, okay. We'll blow it up before it gets too many soul rings. All right. I'm going to use that. I'm going to pay for this mere incubator. I'm going to tap it. Your end step. Boof. Look at all. It's this is a cool card, Alex. I'm really proud of you on this one. Oh, you're sweet. I love this card. This is in my Emrakul group hug artifact deck. And. Uh, just like you said in, in your tip for newer players, my main win con through that deck is commander damage. Yep. Because Emrakul is a very big girl and she swings true. Um, but if she's not a very big girl, she's not swinging through, maybe she got stolen, maybe she's uh, out of commission for a while, then here's my other win con. My commander's not there. Exile 30 plus artifacts out of my library mm -hmm. and just go to town. Uh, it's very fun. Mike, this card is in 219 decks. That is 0% of 416,000 decks. Yep. It costs 52 cents. If you have an artifact deck, you're looking for some new fun win cons, Mirror Incubator. I think the new standard I'm going to ask people to take whenever we do this segment is think of the most oppressive, awesome strong commanders you possibly can and just tell me whether or not this could go in there and that's it that that's just the only way I'm, I'm asking is tell me if this has any value whatsoever alex does this go in an urza deck <laughs> right <laughs> like, you know it would it would mike if you weren't too busy cramming your uh your fast mana in there absolutely right exactly if, but, if you were playing a a power six or seven Urza deck, 
if such a thing existed, this would fit right in. I think Urza hits the table and it says I'm an eight and a half unless you're literally playing with half a hand. Just, but either way, the point is is that it can go in there. It mm-hmm. can go in Brea. It can go yeah. in these like, oh, these are real good. Duretti. God, oh gosh, Duretti. Mom Spietti. Um, It's an awesome card. Really good job this week. Um, I am going to talk about a card that you have a fond love of. Um, love it. But I picked it first, so I win. Um, we're going to talk about another group hug effect called Heartwood Storyteller. Now, this is a one generic, two green, two three tree folk creature. Only line of text is whenever a player plays a non creature spell, each of that player's opponents may draw a card. Now, it's extremely group huggy. Alex, I love this card so much. Mike, I have <laughs> never once resolved that card. And had the table draw fewer than twenty cards. Yep. Uh, if, if yeah, if you it, it, this is this is one of those things where the symmetrical effects you have to put into air quotes because if you play stuff like this, um, you're looking real good at oh I'm gonna draw everybody all of the cards and possibly mill them out kind of effects. You're also playing this to oh I I play only creature spells. So I'm just going to draw cards the entire time. Who would you make also, a deck like that, Mike? I don't know. Some I don't weird know. dude. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's it's in that deck. Don't you worry yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's in Vanifar. It better be. It better oh, it be is. in a couple of different decks. You want to be real mean about it? Make a Zyrus deck and put this in there. Holy cow. I'm going to give everybody cards and everybody's going to give me snakes in return. There's a bunch of different ways that you play this. Um, I think... I think the most, like, oh, we're going to do this, let's go, abilities are, like, when you put this in a Rurik Thar deck. <laughs> it's just, I'm going to play creatures. Everybody else, you play whatever you want. If you play a non-creature spell, we're all going to draw cards, and you're going to take a butt ton of damage. I, I really like this card. It's in a little bit less than 1% of green decks, uh, just under 1,900 over 206,000. I don't know if it's because it's another symmetrical effect that might not be symmetrical depending on how you're building your deck. I don't know if it's because it is a little bit more of an expensive card. I mean, it's not it's not breaking the bank breaking the bank, but it's it's over $10, you know. It's it's a card that like, oh, I have to really want to put this in the deck to put it in a deck. But it can go in group hug decks. It can go in non-group hug decks. It can go in a bunch of different things, and I just like this card, and I want to see it more because yeah, like, I like drunk cards. At one time, that card was uh, that card was over seventeen dollars. Yeah, it's it's this it's a uh, it's, it's power. It's dip. raw. It's raw value. Yep. and I, I like the fact that it's a two three. Like it actually it, it it doesn't just go away immediately without somebody really trying. It can stick around a little bit. Oh. But who would try? Well, somebody who wants to cast the lightning bolt spell. <laughs> There's an is it player that's really not a fan of this. But and this is this is yeah. very important. We were talking about this in our group hug episode mm-hmm. um, about the concept of parody and breaking parody, and still having group hug effects, symmetric effects that, even though they're handing out a lot of value, you're the one benefiting the most, and. Just like we were joking back and forth there, I run this in a deck that only has creatures in it. You might not do that, but your deck might mostly have creatures in it. Right. And because of that, you're going to be drawing a lot more cards than any of your opponents are. Or just like, if if you've got creatures that say that their power and toughness is equal to the amount of cards in your hand, or, I mean, heck, if you're, if you're the... If you're the Lab Man player, if you're doing something where you having as many cards as possible regardless of how many everybody else has, is good. Well, then this is good for you. Uh, we, I think we're probably going to have, like, one episode every, out of every five is just going to be us basically venting about symmetrical effects are awesome. Why don't people Symmetrical do effects are... Rah, 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 rah. Um, so we're going to go out of symmetrical effects and go on to targeted effects. Um... Alex, for our judge's corner this week, 
Um, I know what hexproof is. I know what shroud is. I think I have a pretty good idea of what protection actually means. And I have, I guess, a pretty good concept of what hexproof from as a certain line of text as opposed to separate all mean. But they're all a little bit different and there's a couple of different things that I'm not sure apply all the time whenever it doesn't synergize the way that you would expect it to. So can you walk me through those effects and where sometimes things might get a, a little bit mixed up on? Yeah, absolutely, Mike. So these are all uh, protection-based effects, right? Okay. We got hexproof, we got shroud, we got hexproof from, and we have protection from. So we're going to talk about all four of those today. We'll go ahead and start with hexproof. Hexproof means on a permanent that this permanent can't be the target of spells or, or abilities that your opponents control, that the controller of that permanent's opponents control. So uh, hexproof is inarguably the stronger version uh, because it allows you to target your own permanence while preventing your your opponents from doing so. I think people have a very good grasp of that. You can also give a, a player can have hexproof, and if a player has hexproof, then that player can't be the target of spells or abilities that their opponents control. Um, so let's let's briefly dip into hexproof from, which is I th I feel like they intended that wizards intended to sort of more formally switch over from the protection keyword over to the hexproof from keyword. Uh, I believe it was, was it Dominaria that we had that uh, hexproof from? I forget which set they were introducing I that believe in. so, but I also don't want to, like, I, I wouldn't, pe I wouldn't chisel that in stone. Yeah, no kidding. Cause we haven't seen it since. Right. Uh, hexproof from, is is very very simple it basically means that if a permanent or a player is hexproof from something maybe hexproof from black uh, then that permanent or that player can't be targeted by any spell or ability that their opponents control if that spell or ability is black right so an ability is black if uh if the spell that it's on is black if the card that it's on is black but this the hexproof from i believe wizards created is, is sort of a much more simplified version of protection which relatively speaking it has a lot more working parts and is harder for players to remember um but we also have shroud here and shroud is a lot like hexproof except that it means that uh, this permanent player can't be the target of any spells or abilities controlled by anybody we have uh we have the two boots right we have swift foot boots and we have uh goodness what's the other one uh lightning uh, greaves lightning greaves thank you and one of them gives uh hexproof and costs two to equip and the other gives shroud and costs zero to equip um and for a lot of decks maybe that shroud's okay but uh i know for for several of my decks I'm going to want to do things like uh, like enchant my commander with an aura or equip it with another equipment, something like that, maybe target it with a spell. Um, you can't do any of those if, if your permanent has Shroud because casting an aura spell or using the equip ability on an equipment uh, are both targeting effects and you cannot target things that you control that have Shroud. So... Let's talk about a brief exception to that, Mike. That's a little bit of, of fun. Uh, I, I guess I would call it judge trivia. That everyone's day becomes a little bit brighter once they know this, because it's going to happen to you at some point. I, uh, I like that fun. Is, I like trivia. Go for it. <laughs> and that is that aura spells. That's an enchantment aura. Mm -hmm. Those when you're casting them, they're going to target. You're going to choose a single target, and that target will be the object that that aura is going to enchant if and when it resolves um so you have a mind control aura you're going to be targeting an opponent's creature to so gain control of it and when it enters the battlefield then it will enchant 
that creature that it's targeting. Um, now, auras only have that targeting effect, which I want to remind us is stopped by Hexproof and is stopped by Shroud. That effect is, is only there when an aura is being cast and entering the battlefield. If an aura is entering the battlefield through any other way, whether that's reanimating it from the graveyard, flickering it, blinking it, returning it from exile, anything like that. If you're not casting the aura, but it enters the battlefield, it doesn't target. And what that means is that that aura can enchant any object, permanent or player, even if it has hexproof or shroud. Now, that sounds a little bit wacky, right? Because it seems like you shouldn't be able to get around it so easily. But right. I assure you, you can. Because so, auras target once when you cast them. Okay, so then let it, let me interject here then. Sure. Well, I guess it's interject, but a question from the crowd. So two different creatures that have a kind of go find an aura... And not cast it, but play it. You have Xur the Enchanter, which is a very popular uh, commander as far as doing a couple of different staxy things, curse things, things like that. It says, whenever it attacks, search your library for an en enchantment card, converted mana cost three or less, and put it into play. So does put it into play mean that you're casting it, or does it just mean that it happens and it's put into play? And you can target whatever you want with it? Or does it mean that it still has the hexproof and shroud kind of effects? It's a very good question, Mike. And this is one of the reasons why Zero the Enchanter is so powerful. Obviously, the main reason he's so powerful is because you're tutoring things out of your library to the battlefield for free. But the other reason why he's so powerful is because putting an aura or enchantment, because it can be any enchantment card, onto the battlefield with Xur is not casting it. Okay. And so it can enchant things that are hexproof or have shroud, uh, and it just straight up ignores those effects. Okay, then what about, and if it's the exact same answer, then great. Uh, if not, let me know what the, what the differences are here. But Sovereigns of Lost Alara says whenever a creature you control attacks alone, you may search your library for an aura card that could enchant that creature, put it onto the battlefield attached to that creature, then shuffle your library. So when it says that it could be attached to that creature, but it's still not saying cast, does that mean that it's saying it couldn't be because it has shroud or hex or because it has shroud? That's an excellent question. Um, basically, when we say that it could enchant that creature. Mm -hmm. we're saying that it needs to have that clause that says enchant creature. And if it's a creature that you control, it can't be enchant creature an opponent controls, which is what some right. R's will say. Maybe another R says enchant legendary creature or enchant something like that. Or maybe it says enchant aura or enchant player, like a curse. Right. Those cards would not be able to enchant that exalted creature from Sovereigns of Lost Alara. Um, but there's one other limitation and that limitation is protection so if that creature has protection from a certain quality or characteristic that the aura that you're looking for has then Sovereigns of Lost Alara will not be able to find that aura and, and enchant it and let's let's go ahead and roll right in here to protection because I think this sure. is probably one of the. This is where it all comes to roost. As far yeah, this as the hexproof and shroud. Like this is where it's. This is the oldest version. This is where it's at. This is the big daddy, and I think once once I talk about this briefly, you're going to you're going to understand a little bit, our, our listeners, that there's probably a good reason why Watsi attempted at least to make an effort to move away from this keyword because okay. it's a complicated keyword it's way more complicated than hexproof or shroud right and even more complicated than hexproof from um 
and I think even a lot of EDH players who, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, would probably have a, a great grasp of protection from because we play all sorts of spells and effects that have that sort of thing that, that this trips a lot of people up. So let's let's talk about it here. So protection from a quality. When we say that something has protection, we're talking about debt. That's our that's our acronym. Debt means that that object can't be dealt damage, enchanted or equipped, blocked, or targeted by any spell or effect that has that quality. So that was a lot. Let's break that down. So let's say that you have a bolt, a burn spell. I have a bolt. <laughs> Um, and that's, uh, and you're, you're targeting something that has protection from red. So because it has protection from red, that's the T. It can't be targeted by that spell. It's not a legal target and you wouldn't be able to choose it as the target for your bolts initially when you cast it. And if after you cast it, that creature gained protection from red at instant speed, then that creature would become an illegal target and Bolt would fail to resolve. It would go to your graveyard. I no right? longer have a Bolt. <laughs> you tried to Bolt the bird and you failed miserably. Damn you, bird. Okay, so fair enough. So if something gains protection or has protection, you cannot target it with the thing it has protection from. That makes sense. Right. Uh, next we have enchantments and equipments. So, auras and equipments, and I have to mention it because it technically exists, fortification, which is an equipment for a land that they only printed one of. If your object has protection from a quality, say protection from artifacts, if you had a creature that had protection from artifacts, it could not be equipped by any equipment. Because equip abilities on an equipment, it says equip 2, equip 5, whatever it says, that's an activated ability that says okay. attach this equipment to target creature you control, equip only as a sorcery. And the E in debt is can't be enchanted, can't be equipped, and under your breath can't be fortified. Okay. If something that is enchanted or is equipped gains protection from effects of that quality, say, I have my uh, my commander all suited up, my Voltron commander, with a bunch of equipment, and then somebody gives my commander protection from artifacts, that's bad news for me. Sure. Because that means as a state-based action, all of my equipment is going to immediately fall off of my commander and I can't put it back on. So that's pretty brutal. Likewise, if you have an aura enchanting or multiple auras enchanting an object and that object gains protection from any of those auras qualities, for example, if you tried to hit me with the curse of exhaustion but I had protection from whites, uh, then it would fall right off. You wouldn't be able to hit me in the first place with it, but if I gained it at instant speed, if I gained protection at instant speed, uh, it would become an illegal target. If I gained it afterwards, then the, the R would fall right off. So it simply okay. can't be done. And it can't be dealt damage. The object can't be dealt damage by sources that have that quality. So Blasphemous Act, for example, is a red board wipe that says that it deals 13 damage to each creature. Now, it doesn't target those creatures, but it does deal damage. So if you had a creature that had protection from red, Blasphemous Act would not be able to deal any damage to it, even though it doesn't target. Got it. Right? And lastly, we have uh, blocking. Attacking creatures with protection from a quality can't be blocked by creatures that have that quality. So... 
creature has protection from blue, and I'm attacking with that creature. If any of my opponent's blockers are blue, none of those creatures can block that creature. It's hmm. just out of the question. It's not a legal block. It's almost like my creature has flying, and they don't have reach, right? Okay. It's, it's almost <clears> like <throat> they cannot target your creature to block it. Well, we got to be real careful, Mike, because you don't target <laughs> to, to block a creature. Right? I know. That's why I said it's almost like. I'm doing my almost best. Like, almost like. Um, there are a few interesting clauses for protection mm-hmm. uh, that I'll just touch on here because they work pretty straightforward, even though they are a little funny to read. Uh, you may be familiar with a card named True Name Nemesis. Uh, True Name Nemesis is a merfolk that has uh, protection from the chosen player. When it enters, you'll choose a player, and it has protection from that player. That means that it can't be debt. It can't be dealt damage by any source uh, controlled by that player. Okay. It can't be enchanted by any aura controlled by that player. It can't be blocked by any of that player's creatures when it attacks, and it can't be targeted by anything that player does. Wow. So, so it's not even protection from that player. It's protection from that player and everything about that player. Exactly. Wow. Okay. Yeah, you lock them right out. Uh, they printed that in a commander set, but that is a legacy card. Um, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, the last thing I'll mention here is... Uh, goodness, it's it's not uh, Perforos. I'm really embarrassing myself here. Who's Who's our big, big boy? I mean, whenever you say that, I think Emmer cool. I know, I know, I got it <laughs> wrong, but now I'm conditioned. Progenitus, thank you. There Progenitus. we go. Yeah. Oh, so protection Progenitus, from everything. Yes, yes I recognize from that one. Everything. What? What a incredible keyword! Protection from everything. Protection from everything means that Progenitus can never be dealt damage by anything. It can't be equipped or enchanted by anything. It can't be blocked ever. And it can't be targeted by anything. So it's immune from those four things from any player. It has super duper protection. And Mike, if you have any follow-up questions, you can go ahead and ask. But that's the end of my segment. I mean, Progenitus sounds pretty powerful. Hopefully it's not like a really big creature or anything like that. Otherwise, Oh, it's enormous. It's a (laughs) 10-10. But uh, there's one other card that has that effect. That's Teferi's Protection. Teferi's sure. Protection gives its caster protection from everything. Huh. That's fair. Yeah. So, protection, hex. so Hexproof, Hexproof from, Shroud, Protection, all pretty straightforward. I've never heard the debt acronym, so I really appreciate that. Can't be dealt damage, can't be enchanted or equipped, can't be blocked, can't be targeted. That's pretty Absolutely. slick. Absolutely. I like that. Um, But like all things in Magic, uh, where it says, when this happens, it's absolute. You can't do anything about it. Unless you can. And the one that I wanted to talk about was Spectre Ward. Because I love this stupid card. (laughs) Three generic, two white enchantment aura. Enchant creature. Enchanted creature gets plus two, plus two. And has protection from all colors. Second line, that effect doesn't remove auras. So even when it has protection, it says, by the way, these other things that would slip off of it because it has protections from the other auras that were already on it, never mind. Don't worry about that. We're changing the rules. Just on this card, though. Right. Spectral it's... Ward is is really the only card that I'm aware of like that. I think there might be some more, but um, yeah, it has protection from colors. Yep. So... Except no for auras of, that are already there. Right. Except for auras <laughs> that are already on it. So that's we gotta be very specific. Guys, auras that are weird. auras that are currently attached to uh to Spectre Ward that have a color, which is every aura in the game except for yep. uh Eldrazi Conscription. Except for that one. <laughs> the only colorless aura. Um if they're attached to Spectre Ward, then it or if they're attached to the creature that it's better word is enchanting, excuse me. Uh, then those auras won't fall off as a state-based action. However, any new auras that you try to enchant that creature, if they're colored auras, which is all of them except for that one. That one. They can't go on. They're not legal targets, right? So, yeah, that's there's always an exception. 
uh, to to every absolute, of course. That's why you're here, Alex, to tell us how things work, except for the times where they don't, because of, of another thing. But then there's this other... Magic is complicated. So, you know what, everybody? Just do something totally in your control to have fun. Like, First Blood Monarch, or Two-Headed Giant, <laughs> or something like that. Alex... Thank you very much for walking me through that. Thank you very much for joining us this week. It's always a pleasure, Mike. Everybody, thank you for listening. We'll be back next week. And, you know, the amount of fun that you can have in a game, it can vary. Put some variance into it, and you'll have more fun. I promise. See you next time.